Welcome back everybody to week four. This week, after doing a lot of work on demographics, we're going to talk about influences on consumers. It's going to build on the work that we did on demographics, but it's going to talk about how we understand the different contextual impacts that our consumers face every day as they make their buying decisions. We'd all like to think that we're very took to influence, and the fact is most consumers, especially in today's media-savvy environment, are very took to influence. That means it's all the more important for us to understand what the contextual influences are that impact why our consumers make specific buying decisions. So let's get started. So first off, we obviously have a lot of practical influences, and we've been talking about that all semester long from different angles. When we talk about practical influences, we go back to the debate around needs versus wants, as well as looking at people's demographics. Sometimes we have to buy things. For instance, let's say you have a big presentation at work and you need to get a specific connector in order to be able to hook your laptop up to the projector so everyone can see the great PowerPoint slides you've created. That's a completely practical influence. Let's say you've just bought a home and you need to buy home homeowner's insurance, or you've just had a baby and you need to buy or borrow baby things. Those are completely practical influences coming from your life stage or your work situation. When you're working to influence consumers, when they already have a practical need to make a purchase that's driven by an immediate work or life stage need, the important thing is to influence them to understand the value of your product or to build an emotional connection with the consumer if it's something that's an impulse buy, like maybe a particular baby pacifier or a particular kind of notebook you might need for work. Those are the kinds of things people might buy really on the spur of the moment. In those cases, the emotional connection and the emotional influence of the brand on the consumer can go that little extra mile in making them decide to purchase from you versus from one of your competitors. But when it gets down to the nitty gritty of why the purchase is happening, it's because the consumer had an immediate, very practical need. Some consumer goods in the practical, um, practical purchase category are bought as a group. How many times have you and your roommates or you and your family decided together what kind of cereal you ought to buy? Maybe you buy a different flavor for everybody in the household based on what your preferences are, but let's say you particularly like oat cereal, but your family member or your roommate kind of likes whole wheat cereal, but not that much. So with limited budget, you decide you're going to go for oat cereal. That's a purchase that's bought as a group where there are what are called stakeholders, multiple people who have a right to take part in that decision. So maybe your mom is gluten-free, maybe your roommate's vegetarian. So the whole bag of groceries that you purchase as you go grocery shopping is going to have products for every one of them because of those different influences they have as family members or stakeholders in making that purchase. When you look at consumer goods, it's not just groceries. A lot of purchases are made as a group. Family cars, for instance, homes, whether it's big or little, there are a lot of influences that are the practical needs of several people. So when you think about the practical needs of consumers and how those influence their why of the buy, those practical needs can actually be the often conflicting practical needs of an entire group which need to be negotiated and or all met at the same time. This complicates consumer purchasing decisions, but it also shows that there are different avenues for marketing for group purchases. Think about how many sugary cereals are marketed to children. The kids are not the ones going grocery shopping. It's usually the parents or the older siblings or the grandparents, but the kids become an influence on that practical buying decision of what cereal flavor to get because they've been influenced and because they have a say in what kind of groceries are bought. So when you think about marketing and the why of the buy, a lot of consumer goods really are marketed based on the purchase being a group decision. We've talked about this before, life cycle influences overlap with demographic influences to trigger buys. But what the difference is, is that a demographic influence is a lot more stable than a life cycle trigger. So for instance, family size. 
if you have a family of six, that means you're going to need a larger home, and that's a fairly stable demographic factor with you. On the other hand, living arrangements can change all the time. You have a roommate join, you have a roommate leave. These are called life cycle influences that are much more short term and that can influence the immediate need to buy an extra sofa or an extra chair, for instance. Other life cycle influences look more towards the future. For instance, are you going to buy that couch when you're soon going to move out of your dorm? Are you going to be able to afford a better one once you get your first job and you're out of college? That's a life cycle decision that you need to make if you need a sofa right now. Am I going to just get something free from somebody or am I going to make a purchase that's going to be discarded short term? That is the kind of life cycle influence that consumer marketers often have to think about when they're marketing a product and address the specific needs that people have at particular points in their year or their month or throughout the life cycle to make a particular kind of purchase. Maybe you're moving into your first home and you need slightly more durable, slightly higher quality furniture. That's when a company like, say, an IKEA will market to you that their products are still value products. You can still afford them, even at an early stage of life when you maybe have a lot of bills to pay and not a lot of income coming in. And yet it's not as temporary as dorm room furniture. It's a little bit of an investment, but still something you can afford. When you're talking about maybe people with a bunch of kids, more settled in life, higher income, you're going to see higher quality furniture being marketed to them that is more expensive and yet at the same time will also last longer. Those are life cycle related influences. Working on the consumers, helping them decide what they need to buy, and marketers then jumping in and providing them the information and the products that they need to fulfill those life cycle related needs. But those are the practical needs. What about our social influences? We're not talking about peer pressure here. We're talking instead about word of mouth. We've already talked about peer pressure or purchases that we make to fit in with particular groups, but that's not all there is to the social influences on consumers that we see every day. Consumers really trust brands that they see performing well among their peers. How many times have we asked the person sitting next to us in class whether they like their laptop or not, and based on the feedback from several classmates, decided to maybe purchase a Mac next time or go with a particular brand of PC. That's a social influence. It might also be a life cycle influence because you've just started college and you need a laptop, but the brand that you're buying, that's social influence. And again, it isn't peer pressure. You're asking rational um, feedback of your peers to find out what kinds of products actually work for them. Part of the reason we do that is because our peers are really our testing lab as consumers. They have similar lifestyles to us, therefore they have similar needs to ours, and if a product works for them, we know it's going to work for us. One special kind of social influence is the social influence exerted by what are called early adopters. That's the person in every social group, and you probably have a friend like this who always has the newest gadgets or wears the latest style or tries the latest makeup techniques. That's the person who's looked up to in the peer group as particularly influential in a product category because they stay knowledgeable and they try out products before anybody else has to, and then they spread the word among their friends as to whether that makeup, that laptop, or whatever other product it is actually works or not. Those people are called early adopters, and marketers often give people like that free products or try to identify them throughout social media channels as a way to get products into particular peer groups or social groups. However, the most reliable early adopters are the people who don't work as influencers at all, but just like to share their knowledge on a specific topic. And I'm sure we all have a friend like that and appreciate them very much. So what are the types of influences we get from our social group? One is information. Let's say you see your friend Jennifer wearing a great cardigan and you ask her, is that as comfortable as it looks? And she says, yes, you go to the store and you buy it. Utilitarian, on the other hand, is more of a peer pressure influence. It means that you need to buy that product in order to fit in with your peer group. Maybe you have uh, your friends have been judging you because you don't wear the right brand of sneakers. 
we might want to get better friends, but at the same time, sometimes we need a product to fit in with a peer group for a completely legitimate reason. Let's say our friends have all decided to take up yoga, and we've decided that we want to try it out with them. That means you're going to need a yoga mat. That's a utilitarian kind of social influence where everyone decides that they need a particular product in order to fit together as a group or engage in activities together as a group. But you can also have a value expressive social influence. And that could be when a friend talks to you about the environmental impact of eating a particular food and you decide that you're not going to, for instance, eat as much meat because they told you about the environmental impacts of eating meat. The other thing could be they tell you about having an electric car and its benefits. So sometimes people will share influ influence because of specific values that you have in common. And you'll come to understand that there are better ways of expressing your values or new products or behaviors becoming available that you can engage in that help express those values that you have in common. That's the kind of peer influence you usually get from peers who have already strongly identified with the same values that you have. But sometimes we're influenced by people we don't even know. There's a fair amount of coverage of this earlier on, and I know we've talked about it, so a quick review. One is aspirational groups, and we've talked about that in terms of buying products that help us indicate membership in an aspirational group. One of those influences are when the aspirational group, in turn, turns around and actually indicates that we ought to buy something. That's what happens with celebrity endorsements, for instance, but also with branded merchandise from sports teams that we support. The aspirational group either provides the merchandise or endorses the merchandise, and we feel that we need to buy those products in order to show that we aspire to be like those particular people. But there's also another kind of influence, the associative group. That's when we buy a product, for instance, to show pride to a group that we already belong to. It might be wearing your college t-shirt around town. It might be carrying around the free tote bag you got at a conference that you attended, or carrying around, for instance, a anime product of some kind, a tote bag, or wearing an anime t-shirt to show that you're into anime. That's an associative group, and sometimes you'll buy a product just to show your association with the group. Other times, however, again, the group itself makes merchandise available or endorses merchandise and indicates that they really prefer for you to have this product or you just makes it available for you in a way that wasn't available before for you to have a particular product to show your association or your pride in that group. All of this kind of social influence basically forms the core of what we call word of mouth marketing. And even in this media saturated world, in fact, especially because we live in a media saturated world, word of mouth is one of the strongest influences on consumers because we know it's trustworthy. Whether it's the friend who's wearing a particular cardigan that we think looks comfortable and they tell us it is, or it's the friend who tells us that they switched over to a particular kind of computer and now their work goes by much faster, that kind of information spreads quickly through groups. The closer our association with the other members of the group, in other words, the more similar they are to us, the more time we spend with them, the more quickly information spreads from group member to group member and the more we trust it. There are more proof points for informa informational influences. So in other words, when we get information from a peer, um, group member, we can ask them more questions, we trust them more, and that in information is much more influential than a product brochure or something we see um, in any kind of advertising. And of course, with word of mouth marketing, there is the negative side, which is the hazard of utilitarian influence. In other words, peer pressure, when people feel that they need to have a particular product in order to belong. The more a consumer relies on word of mouth and on their peer group, the more both the positive and the negative influences are there. And it's up to the individual consumer to decide, just as with any other kind of influence and any other kind of marketing, whether they're going to go along with the messages that we're receiving as consumers or whether we're going to question them. Overall, when we talk about influences on consumers, 
the key word here is questioning. Where am I getting this information from? Does the person providing the information have a vested interest? Is it in my best interest to go along with this influence if I'm being told to purchase something? Or is it in my best interest to stand up for my own beliefs and my own needs? That's one of the things that we need to make our own individual decisions about as consumers. So when we talk about influences on consumers, as marketers, we need to understand what those influences are and leverage them to get the information out there to our consumers in a way that they will trust. Whether that means providing free product to somebody who's a leader among their peers and whose technical um, advice is often relied upon, or whether it means thinking ethically about how we market to children when they have an influence on the purchases that the family is making, or thinking about how to market products as being beneficial for all members of the family. As marketers, it's our job to think about how to influence consumers in a way that is healthy, positive, ethical, and informational. At the same time as consumers, it's our job to sort through all of the different influences, whether they feel like practical influences, like I need a new sofa because I've just moved into a new apartment, or whether they feel like utilitarian influences, such as I feel like I should dress more fashionably in order to fit in with this group, or wear a particular sports team's logo, Think about what those influences are causing you to do in terms of purchasing behavior and think about whether they really reflect your own beliefs and your own values. It doesn't mean that you should not be influenced by the many practical and social impacts around you. It means that you want to be savvy in sorting out your own needs as a consumer and figuring out your own why of the buy.